ಓಮಜ್ಞಾನತಿಮದನ್ನಸ್ಯಾಜ್ಞಾನಂಜನಾಶಲಾಖಾ ಚಕ್ಷುರುನ್ಮಿಥೇನ ತಸ್ಮೈ ಶ್ರೀ ಗುರುವೇ ನಮ ವೆನ್ ಐ ಥಾಟ್ ಅಬೌಟ್ ಟುಡೇಸ್ ಕ್ಲಾಸ್ ಅ ಫ್ಯೂ ಡೇಸ್ ಅಗೋ ವೆನ್ ವಿಶಾಖಲೀಲ ಹೂ ಸೆನ್ಸ್ ಔಟ್ ದೀಸ್ ಮೆಸೇಜಸ್ ಫಾರ್ ದ ಕ್ಲಾಸಸ್ ಆಸ್ ಮಿ ದ ಟೈಟಲ್ ಆಫ್ ದ ಕ್ಲಾಸ್ ಐ ಹ್ ಬಿನ್ ಥಿಂಕಿಂಗ್ ಅಬೌಟ್ what it took for prabhupad to do what he did and therefore i titled this class get your jala due to consciousness because that was a theme that i heard over and over again during prabhupad's appearance day we had two days of offerings where devotees wrote something glorifying our founder acharya and again and again i kept hearing the word jaladuta 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 it represents something very strongly in the minds of devotees everywhere and probably will in throughout history because it it was at that juncture that he broke away from all ideas of safety of course he didn't have any ideas of safety but others thought that uh he would be safe if he stayed in india it was risking his life to go go away to a foreign land at his age and condition of health without any backing and so forth so what does it take to do that and why don't i do that uh it's exciting to explore this because our as souls we actually according to krishna in the bhagavad gita and something that we can experience for ourselves are eternal that means we don't die it's one of the ways in which i hold back and think that i can't do this or i can't do that i can't remember how many times or count how many times i've read little vignettes from people who write about what people regret right before they leave the world You've probably seen them they're all over the internet. People say these are the five things people regret most right before they leave. And none of them have to do with trying to be safer in the material world because one loses one's uh one gains a perspective rather that uh there is no safety in this world upon being asked to leave everything behind and go to the nearest exit. a lot of exits in this body you got to take one of them to get out but you're asked to leave just like on the airline they tell you in preparation in case there's a crash that to leave your valuables behind and i know i always think well i'm not leaving mine behind <laughs> everybody else can because <laughs> the the uh that connection is so strong so, but those are my things martin luther king once said uh, <clears throat> until you find something you're willing to die for then you're not fit to live properly and uh I believe it was a manual kant said that that to die to live die to live so there's a way in which uh one actually frees oneself when one discovers this chala due to consciousness of realizing that a uh, krishna is the protector and the provider and that if and that the more i give my my life my efforts my focus to krishna's mission and following his instructions come what may the more exhilarating my life is and the more i actually uh, find freedom so i i will read a few of the lines that proper wrote with he was on the jala duty because we're going to do an investigation together tonight to discover what is this jala duty consciousness does that sound all right yes. so we'll start our sleuthing here by reading a few bars from what proper wrote what was his state of mind when he was actually on the ship and it's amazing that we have this this is a poem called markine bhagavata dharma krishna consciousness in america by his divine grace ac bhaktivedanta swami prabhupad on september 17 1965 
His Divine Grace A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada arrived in Boston on board the ship Jaladuta, carrying within his heart the orders of his spiritual master to spread the teachings of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu beyond the borders of India throughout the entire world. As he looked out upon Boston's bleak and dirty skyline, he could understand the difficulty of this sacred mission and felt great compassion for the godless people. Thus, with perfect humility, he composed this historic prayer in Bengali, praying for the deliverance of all fallen souls. My dear Lord Krishna, you are so kind upon this useless soul, but I do not know why you have brought me here. Now you can do whatever you like with me. But I guess you have some business here. Otherwise, why would you bring me to this terrible place? Most of the people here are covered by the material modes of ignorance and passion, absorbed in material life. They think themselves very happy and satisfied. And therefore, they have no taste for the transcendental message of Vasudev. I do not know how they will be able to understand it. But I know your causeless mercy can make everything possible because you are the most expert mystic. How will they understand the mellows of devotional service? O oh Lord, I am simply praying for your mercy so that I will be able to convince them about your message. All living entities have become under the control of the illusory energy by your will, and therefore, if you like, by your will, they can also be released from the clutches of illusion. I wish that you may deliver them. Therefore, if you so desire their deliverance, then only will they be able to understand your message. The words of the Srimad Bhagavatam are your incarnation. And if a sober person repeatedly receives them with submissive, submissive oral reception, then he will be able to understand your message. It is said in the Srimad Bhagavatam, Sri Krishna, the personality of Godhead, who is the Paramatma, super soul in everyone's heart, and the benefactor of the truthful devotee, cleanses desires for material enjoyment accumulated in the heart of the devotee of the devotee who has developed the urge to hear his messages, which are in themselves virtuous when properly heard and chanted. By regular attendance and classes on the Bhagavatam and by rendering of service to the pure devotee, all that is troublesome to the heart is almost completely destroyed and loving service unto the personality of Godhead, who is praised with transcendental songs, is established as an irrevocable fact. As soon as irrevocable loving service is established in the heart, the effects of nature's modes of passion and ignorance, such as lust, desire, and hankering, disappear from the heart. Then the devotee is established in goodness, and he becomes completely happy. Thus established in the mode of unalloyed goodness, the man whose mind has been enlivened by contact with devotional service to the Lord gains positive scientific knowledge of the personality of Godhead, in the stage of liberation from all material association. Thus the knot in the heart is pierced and all misgivings are cut to pieces. The chain of fruitive actions is terminated when one sees the self as master. They will become liberated from the influence of the modes of ignorance and passion and thus all inauspicious things accumulated in the core of the heart will disappear. How will I make them understand this message of Krishna consciousness? I am very unfortunate, unqualified, and the most fallen. Therefore, I am seeking your benediction so that I can convince them, for I am powerless to do so on my own. Somehow or other, O oh Lord, you have brought me here to speak about you. Now, my Lord, it is up to you to make me a success or failure as you like. O oh, spiritual master of all the worlds, I can simply repeat your message. So if you like, you can make my power of speaking suitable for their understanding. Only by your causeless mercy will my words become pure. I am sure that when this transcendental message penetrates their hearts, they will certainly feel gladdened and thus become liberated from all unhappy conditions of life. O oh Lord, I am just like a puppet in your hands. So if you have brought me here to dance, then make me dance. 
Make me dance, O Lord, make me dance as you like. I have no devotion, nor do I have any knowledge, but I have strong faith in the holy name of Krishna. I have been designated as Bhaktivedanta, and now, if you like, you can fulfill the real purport of Bhaktivedanta. This prayer especially is even more notable because just after coming to America in this mood and with this kind of prayer, Prabhupada, of course, not without some major discomfort or trials and tribulations, was able to fulfill the mission to spread Christian consciousness all over the world. And noteworthy also is that a contingency of devotees had earlier been sent by Srila Bhaktisiddhanta Saraswati Thakur, who's also the spiritual master for A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada, to, to uh, go to England to spread Krishna consciousness, and they were not successful. And in one of his purports in the Sri Chaitanya Charamrita Adi Lila, Srila Prabhupada mentions that the attitude they had was not Jaladuta consciousness. It wasn't adjusted properly, and therefore they weren't successful. And Prabhupada's attitude, as he expressed over and over again in his writings and speeches, was that he was depending on Krishna and that he had fixed his mind on a very specific order that his spiritual master had given him. And because of this, and a, a willingness to die for what mission he had been given, uh, he was successful. So how does that translate for us in our lives? How do we get our Jaladuta consciousness? So one thing I, I was considering was that we can remember the rare opportunity that we have. We, according to the scriptures, in, as humans, have been given an extraordinary opportunity. In fact, there's a picture that is in many of our books that shows the transmigration through many species that the soul undergoes. There are pictures of fish and bugs and birds and hippopotami and all kinds of uh, other species of life. The Vedas say there are 8,400,000 species of life. And out of those, there are just uh, some, uh, a few species of human beings. And that when one comes to this position of human life, one's been given uh, an open door. It's an open door policy in human life. Once we come, the cage is open. You can actually go free. And you have full facility to ask questions and to explore the heights of, of your potential. Oftentimes people, though, become conditioned and think that simply surviving is a great achievement. But uh, the Shastras tell us that survival is already taken care of, especially for those who dedicate their lives and consciousness to become uh, servitors of the Supreme. For instance, uh, Narada Muni, in his teachings to Srila Vyasadeva, says that there are many things that you can achieve by wandering around the material world, uh, but none of them is uh, permanent or noteworthy, except when you inquire about the Supreme Absolute Truth. And it says that if you try to avoid misery and try to get more happiness on the material level, you're, you're ultimately going to 
get what you deserve anyway. So don't try so hard for that. Try for something much more, he says. Try to achieve that end that is not part of the material world. It's beyond the three modes of material nature. And in the Gita, Krishna says a similar thing in 245, when he says, Trai gunya vishaya veda, nistrai gunyu pavarjuna, nirdvanvo nityasattva so nir yoga, shema atmavan. And let's look at Prabhupada's translation of this verse. It can be inspiring in this vein that we're exploring. The Vedas mainly deal with the subject of the three modes of material nature. O Arjuna, become transcendental to these three modes. Be free from all dualities and from all anxieties for gain and safety and be established in the self. So uh, be Atmavan. Worry about your highest self-interest. Don't worry about adjusting your situation in the material world. So first thing is to remember the rarity of our opportunity. So a couple of verses. One is, both are from the 11th canto, ones I'm thinking of. There are more, but these ones are famous. One of them is 11, 2017. It says that the human body is uh, more technically advanced and useful than the iPhone 7. <laughs> Which uh, I've heard mixed reviews about, but there's no mixed reviews about the human body called Nri Deham. Nri Deham is the most uh, perfectly designed and, and highest technological achievement in this material world because it has everything built in camera system, dual also. <laughs> You can long range, short range. <laughs> and uh, it says that Nri Deham Ajam Sulabam Sadulabam. Boy, what emphasis it's giving here. That how rare of an opportunity we have. You've, you've been given the greatest opportunity, technology, technologically advanced machine uh, through which. You can navigate your way out of the material world altogether. Dri deham ajam sulabam, sulabam. It's, it's um, effortlessly attained. It's given to us by uh, material nature. In fact, at the time when you leave this body, you can't uh, put in a request. I mean, you can, but there's no guarantee that you're going to get another one. A lot of people ask, well, you know, couldn't I have five more years? No. Can I be born in America in an upper middle class family? Probably not. <laughs> you know, you, you don't get your choice when, when you leave. So sulabam means when, when you're given this opportunity, really take advantage of it. Sulabam, sudurlabam then means that although it's impossible to obtain, even with the greatest endeavor, you've got it. You've been given this uh, Sulabam su, sudurlabam. Nri deham ajam sulabam sudurlabam. Means that thing which is impossible to attain. You can't buy it. It doesn't matter if you're a billionaire. You've been given this opportunity and it's, it's come to you. It's just your, your time was up and it was given to you by material nature effortlessly. So he goes on to say, uh, describe what this machine can do. Plavam sukalpam guru karnadaram. So plavam, if you'll scroll down to the word for words, means a boat. So you think of this body as a boat. And that's consider the Jaladuta consciousness that uh, Prabhupada got on the boat. And we have our own boat. So consider you're on a boat. You're, you're, you're floating in the material world. You have to go somewhere. Uh, don't just stay in the harbor. So Sukalpam means that it's extremely suited for this purpose. And again and again, we get direction from the scriptures that the sole purpose of the human body is to inquire about the Supreme Absolute Truth. The first aphorism in the Vedanta Sutra says, Atato Brahma Jignasa. Now you've got this body, use it to inquire. And also, 
Tato means because you've tried everything else in the material world and it didn't work out for you. Uh, now use this body to inquire about the Supreme Absolute Truth. Go across the ocean. So then it says, Plavam uh, Sukalpam Guru Karnadaram. For this purpose of going across, uh, you should have direction. You should have guidance. Guru, somebody who's a captain, who can guide you across, that's trained, that's uh, heavy with knowledge. It's like you, you want the, a sea captain that's been across the ocean many, many times who can guide you across. If you get on a boat or an airplane, you know, how many flights have you done? This is my first one. <laughs> Hop on. Uh, but in any case, you need somebody trained to, to help you across. Then he says there's favorable breezes, which happen to be the words of the Bhagavad Gita and the Srimad Bhagavatam. And that if you don't take the opportunity that you've been given to cross over this ocean in this special boat, then you're called Atmaha, it means you really blew it in a big way. I mean, that's strong language. Atmaha means you killed yourself. <laughs> you killed yourself because you didn't take, a, uh, take the opportunity. So this is some impetus the scripture is giving us, saying, look at what you've got. Look at the opportunity. Sometimes it's easy to get depressed in this world because our perspective may become limited to my small little realm of activity and there's so many demands and anxieties and reversals and things like that. And I think, oh, my life is so hard. But if we look on a bigger scale and remember that we've won the lottery of the species and we've attained a human form of life that is this highly a technologically advanced machine that's a boat that can take us all across the ocean, then we can remain enlivened to take advantage of the opportunity. Do you find that to be true? If you, you change your perspective, sometimes you can come out of that kind of, well, maybe that doesn't happen to you. But every once in a while, people say that they become depressed, overwhelmed, too much anxiety. Change your perspective and see what opportunity you have. So the, the second verse, which is very similar, is 11.9.29. And this one, again, emphasizes the rareness of the opportunity we have it says labvam sudurlabam idam bahusam bhavante almost parallel it says after you've done gone through many many births manusha marta damanitam api hadira you've come to this human life and although it's temporary you can get the most out of it of any other life, of any other life form, you can get the most out of this one. Turnam yateta napateda numritya yavan. So it says, uh, while you have the chance, get as much out of it as you can. Nishreya saya vishaya kalusarva tasyat means that uh, ordinary sense gratification is available everywhere for the animals. In fact, they have an easier time of it because they don't have such uh, demands on them. They can simply dedicate themselves fully to trying to get sense gratification. Like I have a cat that lives in my backyard most of the time. Uh, and I don't know where she eats, but she just finds food somewhere. She didn't even have hands. She's got a, you know, uh, I mean, she has paws. But uh, I just see she sleeps, climbs over the fence, uh, hangs out and uh, figures out where to where to drink water, <laughs> where to eat, and animals are like that. They live outdoors. I always I'm struck by that when I'm walking through a forest and I go, "You guys are all living outdoors." It's like, yeah, we don't care. We we have facility here, uh, and uh, eating, sleeping, mating, defending. These are common things that come to animals to say the shastra, but the very uncommon thing that comes in the lottery of the species is the human life when you have the opportunity to inquire. Therefore, the scripture says, take full advantage of it. Take full advantage of it. Don't be afraid to uh, 
take a, a leap of faith, like this Jaladuta. Getting, don't be afraid to use your boat in this way to try to cross over the ocean of material nature. You'll never be criticized by any sadhu for trying that. You'll never be criticized by the Shastra. Others who have a different perspective may criticize you, but uh, the scripture doesn't give so much credence to their opinion. So it, it's enlivening, isn't it, to, to get this information that we have such an opportunity and that we have full permission to take advantage of it if we wish. Don't you think? Yes or yes? Yes. Okay. So the first, the first step I thought of was to, to recall what an opportunity we have and continue to recall that I have a great opportunity. And even if you just have a, even if you only had three days left, like Maharaj Katvanga, he's noted in the scripture for being a big powerful king and he was asked to fight for the demigods for some cause, so he used most of his life to do that, helping others. And then he, he was offered a benediction. He said, the only thing I want to know is how long do I have before I leave? And they said, ooh, just a f few more minutes. And he uh, immediately took advantage of the, those last few minutes and was able to attain perfection. Now that doesn't mean, as we heard yesterday, we had heard an excellent class. Who was that? Who's? Anshu? Yeah, Anshu made this specific point. I think he was asked, wasn't it him? Yeah, our kids here, the great pundits, they give classes. Anshu gave this class and he, he told, when someone asked him, why don't we just go through our whole life and do what we want and at the last minute we can remember Krishna. And he said, it doesn't work like that. <laughs> he said, you, you have to develop some yoga balena, some spiritual strength, some momentum in order to do that. But apparently Maharaj Katvanga uh, had such spiritual strength from his practice during his life, although he was engaged in his occupation up to the last few minutes. But it's noted in the Bhagavatam that Katvanga uh, then turned his attention, took full advantage of the last few minutes he had left. And uh, of course, Prikshit Maharaj is famous for doing that in the last seven days that he had. And then I'm left thinking, you know, how much time do I have? And the, the scriptures say, uh, don't take it for granted that you have any time. You're given this great opportunity, but the verse says, anityam, it's temporary. It's not going to go on forever. And that means that any day could be the last day. So make, stake your claim uh, now for taking advantage of this opportunity. Realize what the opportunity is. That's the first step. You have to see it very clearly. Recall in every way that you can that you have a very rare opportunity to, to um, do something that's not ordinary. Ordinary means maintaining myself in the material world, finding a place to live, uh, which animals do quite nicely without a lot of um, mortgage payments and insurance worries. And uh, they do a little maintenance. I've seen beavers, they you just cut things down with their teeth and they have to keep putting a few more branches on there. Birds build houses too. But they just find straw and so forth. So don't put so much emphasis, but remember your opportunity. Second thing is uh, to amass your motivation. Find, where, find that motivation to uh, take advantage of the opportunity. And we could see that uh, Prabhupada was very motivated by his uh, desire to please his spiritual master. It says in, this, in the scripture that if you have such an opportunity to please a spiritual master, then yasya prasada bhagavat prasado yasya prasada nagati kutopi. If you can uh, find a bona fide spiritual master and render service, and that's pleasing, then your spiritual life can become successful. So he was very fixed on that, and he said many times that his success came from focusing on the order of his spiritual master 
And by following that, he was getting great help from the internal energy. Next is to find your niche, because even in spiritual life, we have to find our niche. Like um, this morning we had a phone call, a conference call, at around 7 a.m. this morning, and there were some devotees uh, from around the world that were on the call, and we were specifically talking in the very beginning about this mission of putting Bhagavad Gita's in motel rooms and hotel rooms. We found out today also that hotel owners don't like it when you uh, tell them that we're with Motel Gita because they're like, well, I don't have a motel, I have a hotel, so get out of here. <laughs> but it was palpable on that call, uh, and I noticed it, that there were professionals on that call who have their own families to take care of, they have uh, business interests, they have to maintain their bodies and so forth, but uh, they're dedicating all their energy for this uh, idea of spreading the Bhagavad Gita as far as possible. They have big goals, like how can we get up uh, from now from 250,000 Bhagavad Gitas to a million? And from there, how can we get up to 20 million? And we were talking about 200 million. How can we get up to a billion Bhagavad Gitas? That's something, uh, that's a niche market. There's not a lot of people in that business. If you go around Silicon Valley and you interview people and you say, um, you know, what do you do? What do they say? I'm an engineer. <laughs> or, you know, there's so many things that we can do. But very few of them say, I'm fixed on getting 200 million Bhagavad Gita's into motels and hotels. That's a, that's a niche market. And uh, it's a spiritual niche market. And if you can get yourself one of those, Prabhupada had a niche market. He was given instruction by his spiritual master. When he asked him specifically, what should I do uh, to please you? He said, if you ever get money, print books. He said, these temples, building big temples, he said, it's so much trouble. They build a big temple. Srila Bhakti Siddhanta built a big temple in Bhag Bazaar. One of his disciples emptied his whole treasury. He was a very wealthy man and built that temple. And afterwards, the devotees in the, in the uh, community were arguing over who was qualified to get which room and so forth. And there was a sense of proprietorship. And other things came up, but Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur then was saying that um, these kinds of things, uh, building temples, come about uh, just as a means of managing the results of, of our teaching Krishna consciousness. And so he, he told Srila A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada, his, his disciple, print books and distribute it in as widely as possible, especially in the English language, because it's the language that is most respected around the world, he said. And so he took that very uh, specific instruction to heart. And when he came to America, for instance, although ISKCON didn't have any money, uh, devotees were very poor back in the old days. Shall I go into more detail about it? How poor all the devotees were? I mean, the devotees really did, they, they barely had enough to keep the doors open. They, were, they didn't have a source of income. Um, none of you were there. There were no Indians, you know, who are upwardly mobile, who are successful and so forth, who were donating to the cause. Nobody was donating to the cause. The devotees would go out and they would sell Back to God Ed magazine for 25 cents and uh, somehow or other try to pay the rent and make a uh, prashadam on Sundays and things like that. And it was a big struggle. And there was um, a big effort in the beginning Prabhupada made to get enough money to buy the first uh, property in ISKCON. And that ended up in uh, Boston. Now you know in New York we rented a place, right? still there on 26 Second Avenue it, uh, called, and the store was a gift shop before that. You remember what it was called? Isn't that a great name? Now, this first property that Prabhupada bought, because he, he told the devotees, go out, we have to get, whoever gets uh, uh, the money together and is able to 
buy the property first, find a property that we can purchase. And he had a very specific reason for it, and I'll tell you in just a second. So the devotees were competing against each other in various cities. There was New York, San Francisco, Santa Fe, Montreal, Los Angeles, trying to see if they could uh, collect some money so they could buy a property. And it happened to be in Boston, the first property in ISKCON. And you know what the street was named? Beacon Street. I thought that was also prophetic because we had the matchless gifts and then the first house that we were able to buy was Beacon Street, as in a beacon of light. So why did he want that building? Because he wanted to put in a printing press. Now, Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur had told him that if you ever get money, print books. So Prabhupada got a little money and he said, I'll use it to print books. So that's why he got the first property. He didn't say, let me build a big temple or anything like that. He said, I'm going to stick to my niche. I'm going to, I'm going to get a place because I need a printing press. Because that's what Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur did. He established a printing press in Calcutta. They were putting out newspapers, magazines, periodicals, books, and distributing them all over India. So he stuck to that. So there, there's a, a, a phenomenon in spiritual life in which if, if you find, uh, if you, you can take shelter of the order of your spiritual master and execute it to the best of your ability, even if it seems like a tiny little thing, if you stick to that niche and you perfect it and do the best you can in that, then uh, mir miraculous things will happen in your life. And this, is, uh, this was Prabhupada's consciousness. This is Jaladuta consciousness. How, how to find that niche and execute it. And um, Prabhupada writes in the Bhagavad Gita, in a purport, that in, the, in this service that we do for Krishna, we should be daring and active. Can everyone say daring and active, please? Daring and active. Yeah. So, how do you execute your, ser your service in a way that is daring and active? And this is uh, one of the moods of, of, the, of those in Jaladuta consciousness, that is, to be daring, take some risks for expanding your practice of Krishna consciousness. Taking a vow is it's kind of taking a risk, isn't it? Is it? Seem a little risky? What are you risking by taking a vow, for instance? Some devotees, they take vows. Even very recently here at ISV, some devotees have taken vows. They do it uh, very purposefully and demonstratively. They come into a situation where their spiritual master is sitting, all the devotees are sitting, Krishna is watching, and then to top it all off, we light a sacred fire just to make sure all the avenues are covered and they say, okay, what vows are you going to make? <laughs> and they sit up and they take a microphone and then it's broadcast all over the internet say, these are the vows I'm taking. That's a little daring, isn't it? Don't you think? What do you find to be daring about that? Or risky? Shamalongi's getting ready to talk, I can tell. You have to follow through. Yeah. Okay. Speaking of which, you also have to turn on the mic. So at that point, uh, he's taking all the vows, but the risk is that, you know, he has to fulfill it throughout his life. It's not that, you know, I'm saying and I'm doing it for a while. So what are you risking? So may, there may be like ups and downs in his life, but he has to follow, he or she has to follow that always. You have to follow, that's the meaning of vow, but what are you risking? Oh. What do you have to lose oh. if you make the vow? And Maybe some sleep. <laughs> some sleep, okay. Hansa Priya, you keep this mic up here, pass the other one back. All the way to the back, Hansa Priya. You're basically agreeing to make that commitment that is going to be your top most priority yeah. of your life. So you're basically saying, 
whatever comes in the way of disturbing those vows, okay. saying no, no, no to those things. You, you may have to give up some things. Yes. And the mind is attached and thinking, oh, but what about my, my own comfort? What if there's things I want to do or something like that? It's a, what I talked about before, die to live, right? Death seems a little risky too because I have to give up my whole sense of self. <laughs> but keeping in mind that I have to do it anyway, it's, it's a... It's actually an intelligent thing to do, die to live, and live uh, for a higher purpose. What are, what are you risking? Anybody else have an idea near Kula? Your independence. Mm, your independence. One might think, oh, I make these vows, and I can no longer be my own person. In fact, I wrote down a few things from psychology today. Uh, about why people don't uh, take these kinds of risks sometimes. They, uh, these uh, people did a lot of research in this area and they, they wrote that uh, they feel it, was, it will reduce my autonomy. I'll feel locked in and I won't be able to choose anymore. Which is interesting because in the Gita, Krishna says, follow the regulative principles of freedom. Right? Raga dvesha vimuktaistu vishayan indrayaish charan atma vashir vate atma prasadam arigachati. He said, if you follow this path of, of making a vow for the Lord, regulating your senses for the sake of uh, Krishna and your spiritual master, then uh, paradoxically you actually become free. Although it seems like it's, it's holding you to a smaller circle of responsibilities and uh, you won't be able to do whatever you want. Actually, it's, it's the opposite. You actually get real freedom. Prasadam arigachati. You can get the full uh, mercy of the Lord by doing this. That's a big promise. And then they say that uh, it creates fear that we'll miss out on future opportunities because we're locked into the plans we've made. Right? I make the vows like, what about, you know? And then there's... Um, reduces our deniability. It's painfully clear when we're no longer on track with our plan and we can't fool others, or more importantly, ourselves. And it creates an image of an overly rigid person, not a spontaneous, carefree person. <laughs> it's like, I'll be seen as very um, conservative following these vows and so forth. And then also he said, uh, it takes effort, it could bring us face to face with our limitations. It could create conflicts with our own self-image. And uh, it can be viewed uh, as socially as in being negative. Because these kinds of things might go on and, and uh, as one's taking these uh, heroic vows. So... Uh, daring and active. This is gel due to consciousness that I, I dare to follow what Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, and w what the instructions are in the Srimad Bhagavatam. I, I dare to take this kind of, of life. And it's very active also. Uh, you're, you're going, you, you have ambition. Just as in the material world there's ambition, and sometimes people say ambition is bad, but spiritual ambition is good. To have ambition to advance the cause of Lord Chaitanya, of one's spiritual master, advance one's own Krishna consciousness. And one may be faced with all kinds of obstacles, as Hansapriya brought up, when one makes that vow. But this is uh, part of Jaladuta consciousness, uh, and it's heroic to do so. And finally, to um, tap into universal intelligence. I took this uh, phrase because I read it recently in the second canto of the Bhagavatam, where Prabhupada's talking about how intelligence is all-pervading. That is, as we read in the Sri Brahma Samhita, andantarasta paramanu chayantarastam. The Lord is present in every atom, fully present. He's fully conscious, fully present, and He's fully observant of everything that's going on. And he's fully capable of responding to every situation. And we are the subtle consciousness, uh, a part and parcel of Krishna, living entity within this 
body, and we can avail ourselves to that universal uh, intelligence. Partly, Prabhupada refers to the, uh, he, he also in that pur same purport says that we can avail ourselves of the Vedic intelligence in the form of Bhagavad Gita. So, uh, being daring and active, those who take shelter of the Bhagavad Gita as their main source of intelligence, this is part of Jaladuta consciousness, that I'm following the path of the saints, I'm following Krishna's advice, and by doing that, uh, one's life becomes directed properly and also very dynamic. And also, uh, as Krishna describes in the Bhagavad Gita, second chapter and elsewhere, Buddha Yoga means that as I enter into this Jaladuta consciousness, that this is my niche in life, to follow Krishna's instructions, to take up the mission given to me by my spiritual master and so forth, that um, the heart becomes purified by following the process of devotional service and one gets direct help from the Supreme Personality of God from within the heart. What's a verse that verifies that in the Bhagavad Gita? All hands go up, yes? Go ahead. So the translation of the verse is that one who is, uh, just paraphrasing it, one who is completely devoted to uh, the Supreme Lord, Sri Krishna, uh, for them, uh, um, the Lord himself helps them by um, giving them the intelligence from within the heart and uh, directing them how they can reach him. Just see how we're experiencing this universal intelligence right now. I'm sitting here, he's sitting there, he's imbibed that verse, he's realized it, and is repeating it. And anyone who stays in contact with the Bhagavad Gita, then, and practices that lifestyle, will also have access to the intelligence coming from Krishna from, from within the heart. Everyone has it anyway, even the animals, have it. Uh, you watch a crow fly across the sky, and how does he know where he's going? It, it's remarkable, actually. And uh, they all know what to do. That's that, that intelligence is universal. So someone who becomes dedicated to this process uh, avails him or herself to this help that Krishna is giving, especially to those who take up this uh, dedicated state of mind to the Bhagavad Gita, to the spiritual master, to the uh, effort of going back home, back to God. He gives special help. That's what that verse means. Tesham, to them, Tesham Satata Yuktanam. They're always engaged in this. Tesham Satata Yuktanam, Bhajatam Priti Purvakam. And they're worshiping me with love. There's a, there's a sense of love there from the devotees. Because once one gives up one's tight grasp on the material world and starts to depend on Krishna and sees that Krishna is reciprocating, there's a sense of love. That Krishna is so kind. He's giving me direction. He's giving me facility and association and so forth. Dadami buddhi yogam tam. So this is an active verb, dadami. It means I give it. I give the intelligence, buddhi yogam, real intelligence uh, that one can get from following uh, Krishna's instructions and worshipping him. Yenamam upayantite, by which uh, they can come to me. So this is an extraordinary journey, and as a summation, a few of the points that I noted is re recall your rare opportunity. Just remember that every day. Remember it all the time that I have the rarest of opportunities right now. And uh, there, there's, a, um, there's a time when uh, the opportunity will expire. Of course, it's good for all time, but we have this window right now in the human form of life, which is being uh, noted by Krishna and others as being a very important window of opportunity. So remember that again and again. Second thing is to amass your motivation. Find one way or another, 
somehow or other invent a way, if you have to, to get motivated for this process. I mean, Prabhupada brings up how Dhruva Maharaj was motivated by what? To go find God. What was his motivation? He wanted to show up his father. He was, did you ever get in a fight at home? Everyone's smiling. Uh, <laughs> ever get in an f- argument at home? Of, and then and then it's like, all right, I'm going to show them. My mother used to say this. She said, never underestimate the power of all show them. <laughs> you know, some people work their whole life. My parents said I'd never succeed. I'm going to show them. And that was the, that was the mood that Dhruva was in. That was his motivation. But Prabhupada writes about how, fine, okay, as long as it's for Krishna, go for it. <laughs> you know, take that motivation. So you have to amass motivation in your life somehow or other. Find a way. Find a way to get motivated. Realize that you have a rare opportunity. The time's going to run out at, at any second. And, you know, be motivated. Surround yourself with good association. And... Remember those who have been successful, even though they started uh, with meager beginnings. And the third one was find your niche. Uh, Specialize in something. Prabhupada said you should know something about everything and everything about something. So uh, devotees... uh, of course, not everyone can't know everything about everything. Everyone has some specialty because we only have a limited intelligence to cultivate so many skills and things like that. But find something that's important to uh, a devotee of significance who's in the line of disciplic succession and try to do something to help that devotee's cause to expand the Sankirtan movement, for example. And find your niche. Uh, sometimes those who are cleaners, they're great cleaners. They dedicate their life to keeping the temple organized and clean. They fight clutter. Uh, public places invite clutter because everyone just leaves things around and they think, oh, someone else will pick it up. That broke, someone else will fix it. <laughs> and, and somebody, uh, we, we have, there are notable devotees. Like there's one I can think of right now in Los Angeles. There's one in, in Chicago, Illinois. And all they do, they live to fix the temple and make sure that it runs properly. Because in Los Angeles, we have a Ratna Bhushan. Uh, who knows what shape the place would be in if he wasn't there. In, uh, in Chicago, ever since I came to Chicago, I went there in 1974, uh, same devotees there, Jotendriya, just walking up and down, fixing everything in the temple. If it breaks, get Jotendriya, <laughs> he'll fix the temple. <laughs> Every place has to have. That's his niche. That's you can. I know Raman and Nasaka is here. <laughs> I I don't want to embarrass him, but you know, find your niche. Find your niche in Krishna consciousness. Of course, he does so many things. That's like one one thing that he does. And and perfect it. If you perfect it, you'll perfect your consciousness. Perfect your service. Find that niche. Get get an order. Get something that's specific to you and then put your whole life into it. It'll never end. It'll go on forever. You can keep expanding it unlimitedly, even if it seems like a tiny thing to start with. And the fourth is, stay daring and active. Don't get lazy. So a couple points that go along with that. I mentioned that uh, Martin Luther King said, if you're not willing, uh, if you can't find something you're willing to die for, then you're not fit to live. You won't live fully unless you're ready to die for something. What is it that you're willing to die for in your life? Uh, Also, invoke your heroic nature. Living entities are actually, Prabhupada mentions in the Shastra, they're actually heroes. There are two kinds of heroes he mentions. One hero is a hero in the material world. Like, you know, Nowadays, people say, oh, that guy, he's like a rock star. I mean, what do rock stars do? They basically go around sort of carefree life, and, and uh, they make a lot of money, and they wreck stuff, and they take a lot of intoxication. This is sort of the, um, you know, the uh, caricature. 
and this is the kind of rock star, like the sense and joy in the material world, Bollywood stars. I drove by one house in Bombay and there was some famous Bollywood star. I'm proud to say I had no idea who it was. But there were throngs of people outside, you know, just trying to get a glance at this person walking out. So you can be a hero in the material world, Prabhupada says. This is in the story of Paranjana. Or you can be a hero in the spiritual side, which means you take vows, you stand up, you're daring and active. You say, against all odds, against the demands of my senses that tell me I should just try to enjoy the lower nature, why try so hard, uh, maybe later, a lot of different excuses. But the hero actually stands up, facho vega manasa, I'll control my tongue, I'll follow the Shastra. And this is, uh, Prabhupada says, real heroism. So in being daring, daring and active, rediscover or find your heroic nature. Be a hero. Be a real hero. And then uh, stick to your founding values. Those things that are bedrock for you. What are the values that, that you won't compromise on at all? And then uh, be willing to be tested. Be eager to be tested, knowing that I'm, st I'm going to stick to my founding value no matter what happens. There was a show back when I was a kid on television. It was called Candid Camera. And uh, they used to go around. Of course, nowadays it's, it happens at every, every street corner because everyone's got a camera. <laughs> back then, cameras were so rare. They would set up a movie camera in hiding, and then they'd trick somebody into some kind of a, an absurd situation and then observe what their reaction was when they were being clandestinely filmed. And uh, remember that um, we're always being watched. Krishna's observing our psychic movements. And uh, real heroism means to maintain that integrity in all circumstances. Uh, don't give it up just because you think you're not being watched. That's the greatest happiness to come to that refined consciousness where I'm aware of the fact that Krishna is observing everything that I'm doing and I'm living to show him that I'll maintain my integrity even uh, behind closed doors, even when uh, there are challenging circumstances. This is Jaladuta consciousness. And this gives one the power to take that Jaladuta voyage wherever you're going uh, for Krishna is that integrity. That's the power behind it. That's the uh, atom that when broken in half, it puts out so much energy, there's a reaction. That was Prabhupada's power. When he came to America, he didn't have anything else. He had his complete integrity. And uh, that's something that's palpable. When one has complete integrity, 100% integrity in spiritual life, then that person uh, exudes spiritual energy so much so that others will be affected by it. So you have to, uh, this is something to work for in life, to have 100% integrity and maintain your foundational values. Don't, um, don't go f for flimsy distractions. It's not worth it. The Shastra says over and over again, fix your mind. Don't let those shiny, flimsy kind of little things that are all around us uh, dis distract us from the momentous opportunity that we have, which is to fix our mind on Krishna. And realize that if you're going to take this journey, once you decide that you're going to take this momentous journey, I'm going to board the Jaladuta, I'm going to do it, do or die, then you'll face uh, mom momentous obstacles. And that's a, something to be ready for, to face momentous obstacles and to learn to tolerate them. I have a few more things, but um, fearing that I'll become uh, monotonous with this and that I've made so many points already, hopefully, let's... Um, take uh, some reflections. And is any one thing that you heard so far that's stuck in your mind that uh, works for you? Kanka's got her hand up in the back.
I like the, um, the part where in the purport it talks about being daring and active and um, how that is, uh, you were talking about how, how we need to be like that in order to um, in, you know, develop enthusiasm for our service and to find a niche uh, in our service. And I, I really saw it in the beginning of the Hare Krishna movement. The devotees were completely daring and active. They, they never even thought anything about themselves. They were just, um, they gave everything to Srila Prabhupada and, and um, did whatever he thought was best to push forward this Hare Krishna movement. And now I see that it's maybe in a different form, but it's still happening um, here in ISV. It's so nice. Yeah, I'd like to, when the devotees go out for book distribution here, and uh, recently, there were, during the summer, there were kinds of opportunities. One was in Haight-Ashbury, which is kind of an interesting place. It's uh, the mecca for the counterculture hippie movement. It all sort of culminated there, or began. Their genesis was there and spread all over the world, but people would come from all over the world to see that place, and now it's such a mixture of lower modes of nature, a few little flashes of Sattvagun every once in a while. But uh, devotees go there who are completely unacquainted with the culture. Those devotees, maybe they were born in South India, never seen anything like that. But because they're on a mission to go out and distribute Prabhupada's books, I see them down there, and they're just being daring and active and approaching people and doing their mission to spread Bhagavad Gita. This is uh, an exhilarating uh, vision to see devotees doing things like that. And opportunities like that abound. That's why Prabhupada took the opportunity, imagine he came to a place that was untouched. Nobody had preached Gaudiya Vaishnavism in America or around the world. And imagine how daring he was just to go everywhere. When I was in South Africa recently, the devotees were telling me how apartheid was full on at that time when Prabhupada came to South Africa. And um, not only people with black skin were excluded from the mainstream of society, people with brown skin, that included Indians. So, you know, Gandhi started there and was kicked off a train because although he, he was a very high class person, he was a, a barrister, he had a ticket for the cabin he was in, they just threw him off the train, and so forth. And actually, it was illegal at that time for the uh, white Africana to mix with even Indians. And did you know that there were apartheid police? And they would go around and enforce that. And so Prabhupada came, and he didn't care anything for it. He just, they greeted him at the airport. In fact, there, he had some, uh, there were, Africans and there were Indian disciples and they would they came and they greeted him at the airport and they were worshiping him in the airport <laughs> and and uh, no excuse me there were, there were white uh, Africanas and they were worshiping this in uh, you know what the, uh, the uh, locals thought were, was an Indian but Prabhupada you know just walked right through it established the Krishna consciousness movement there a few years later there was this um, breaking up of apartheid and so forth. But in, in so many situations, Prabhupada was daring and active wherever he went. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Maharaj, for the wonderful points. And I remember the daring active you say Prabhupada's story when, when I think he was in, uh, he was with Brahman and Prabhu and he, he was recalling that when he was in Kolkata and he... That's got to go a little closer because people are straining. He, uh, he, he, he climbed to the highest uh, the tower, very tall tower, and, and then... When he was a child, he, yeah. there was a building that was being constructed. What was the building? Victoria something. The, some large uh, building, and he climbed up to the top. And he was telling about that, and one of the devotees said, Oh, Prabhupada, you were very courageous back then. And Prabhupada said, I st I'm still courageous. <laughs> Still courageous. Yeah, nice point. Thank you. Yes. Um, I like that when you said um, 
we have got uh, you know this life human life um so um you know we are so fortunate that we have got this life and we should fully devote ourselves toward krishna consciousness and sail our boat towards the almighty so that's the you know that's actually will fulfill the purpose of why we got that life yeah thank you for remembering that and it it's if we analyze how lucky we are actually there's a there's a story prophet used to tell a little analogy about how sea turtles they can stand in water for a long time without breathing but they need to breathe at some point and he said on the vast ocean there's a log floating across and it has a knot hole in it in the middle of the log and then the turtle uh, happens to come up right so that he sticks his head through that knot hole and then gets the air in other words it's a, co a coincidence that the logs floating in the midst of the ocean and the turtle comes up at the same time and that his head actually makes it through the hole and he said that's the rarity of coming to the human form of life and coming in contact with a bona fide spiritual master it's such a rare rare thing so i like your point you know take advantage of it make the voyage while we can it's a boat a boat we can cross with thank you Hare Krishna Maharaj, uh, thank you very much for all the wonderful points uh, aptly called the Jaladutta Consciousness. Uh, what stuck in my mind was uh, find your niche and perfect it. I really like that. Because once you, um, first of all, the verb to find your niche, it, it, it may take some time. And once we find it, the more and more uh, we are engaged in it, um, we'll simply find out ways of perfecting it. I really like that point. Thank you. Yeah, our ability will rise to, uh, to meet our strong desire because Krishna helps. And once in 1975, when we were in Vrindavan, uh, a, a few of the devotees from our team went to meet Prabhupada in his room and to ask him some questions about how to teach book distribution. And one of the things that Prabhupada said during that meeting was that teach the devotees to be sincere he said, every devotee has his or her own genius in, in Krishna's service. And he said, and he went like this, he said, if you teach them to be sincere and they just try to do this service, that time he was talking about book distribution, and he made a sweeping motion with his hand and he touched his heart and he said, then the master from within will teach him how to do it. So... Um, Prabhupada believed in that so much, he taught the devotees that just try to be engaged very sincerely in doing your service and there's uh, a way in which Krishna will help you to get the intelligence and the ability to do what you need to do. And An, an example of that, somehow the, the gain changed on this. And I mentioned Beacon Street, didn't I, early? What was Beacon Street? Yeah, it was the first property owned in ISKCON, and it was in Boston, and Prabhupada moved the printing press in. Actually, he had to bring Nara Narayan, who was an architect builder, to come there to put a huge beam under the floor so that the floor didn't cave in because the printing press was so heavy. And then Prabhupada had uh, been cultivating artists uh, around ISKCON because he had this plan as soon as he got a printing press, he was going to make the Krishna book, and he wanted paintings for it. The first book came out was The Teachings of Lord Chaitanya, the first larger size book, and that, and also the Bhagavatams that Prabhupada brought with him. They didn't have any pictures in them, so Prabhupada wanted color pictures. So where are you going to get those? So Prabhupada uh, started telling these uh, artists, or fledgling artists, or aspiring artists to come, and then he, he revealed to them the manuscript for the Krishna book that he had written. And he said, I need 52 color pictures to go with all these pastimes, all the leelas that are in the book. And the artists started reading through the manuscript and then they said, but Prabhupada, we're just learning to paint. We can't paint God. I mean, these are sublime pastimes of the Supreme Personality of God and who are we to paint anything like this? And how could we possibly do this? And let us go back to art school, Prabhupada. Or go to, you know, learn how to do this. And Prabhupada said, no, stay in front of the canvas and pray and paint. And that's what they did. 
And practically in that building on Beacon Street, it was very austere. There wasn't heat. They didn't have fancy easels. Remember, there, was, <laughs> there wasn't any money back then. And they, they had to lean things up and they, uh, against the wall. They painted and they painted. And you'll, you'll notice that the, the artwork came out fully expressive. We see some of the paintings, the early paintings on the wall, like in the back here. This picture of uh, Krishna with Brahma. That's an original painting, by the way. Uh, that was done in the 1970s. And it was done by devotees reading the pastime. And of course, they would come to Prabhupada and say, is it like this or is it like that? And he would give them instruction. But they just tried. And you'll notice that over time, many of these artists became uh, fully competent and to, to paint in, in great detail. They became master, masterful artists uh, over time, but just trying and praying and, and going on. Not to say that uh, one can't take instruction, but this was Prabhupada's mood. You know, you don't need that much extra. You just need this sincerity and, and just try to, to do your service. Yes, Hansapriya. When we were reading the translation where Prabhupada is asking why you have brought me here, and then he says, I'm your puppet, and my name is Bhaktivedanta, now you help me to prove that. And I was thinking, that is so humility of Srila Prabhupada that he's asking many of us, at least I don't ask that question all the time. But same time, even when we ask, Prabhupada had so much faith, uh, and he didn't. He was so focused. He didn't let anything else creep in. That's the point you made. He was so focused, and he had this universal intelligence that always guiding him. And and I think it's beautiful. I'd never even looked at the whole Jalduta consciousness in such a holistic, deep way. But I'm very happy that uh, we covered that today because it just awakens some more uh, consciousness within us to look at. Get your jaw to do the consciousness. Yes. So we talked about the uh, kind of the permanence in the service that it will always be there. And I found it very uh, interesting to compare it with the uh, professional circles where, you know, a niche market is not that much, uh, you know, uh, uh, it's felt good because you may be considered a dead wood after if you keep doing one thing time and again and you're not exploring further, then that, that is taken as a negative thing. Mm -hmm. But here, like one uh, in the spiritual circles, that this one service is going to be there for you to do all the time. So I find it very interesting. Yeah, there's a story in the, in the Nectar Devotion about a Brahmin from Jyotishtapur, Pragnishtapur, that he, he was very poor and he couldn't afford any puja paraphernalia, he couldn't buy a temple. And however, he went to hear some spiritual talks. And in one of the talks that he would go to on a regular basis, he heard that you can perform devotional service even within your mind. And he began doing his daily puja in his mind. He would sit down and meditate. And he, would, he had beautiful golden water pots and puja paraphernalia. He would go to all the different holy rivers and bring these pots of uh, sacred water and get the best kinds of flower to bring to flowers to offer to Krishna and so forth. And every day he was doing his puja, and then he started also offering sweet rice to the Lord as naivedya. And doing it with full meditation, absorbed in that. And then um, he would test the sweet rice to see if it was cool enough to offer, because as Prabhupada writes, better when sweet rice is cool or cold. And so he was testing one day, so he put a part of his uh, tip of his finger in, and to test it, and it was still very hot. So he jumped, and then he looked at his finger when his eyes opened out of his meditation, it was burnt. And at that point, Krishna and Vaikuntha had noticed his fixation on this service and began laughing. And Lakshmi Devi said, why are you laughing? He said, oh, it's my devotee. We'll go pick him up. <laughs> 
and he sent, there's a picture, we actually have that original picture, that uh, he sends an airplane to come and pick up his devotee for his dedication to the service. He had become perfect. So uh, whatever your service is, if you, you go on, whatever your daily ritual is in worshiping Krishna and the service that you do, it, it brings you to this point of pleasing Krishna and perfection if you do it with full sincerity and endeavor. Malini. Prabhuji, I like the point of tapping into universal intelligence. And um, I was just meditating on this um, today because when we had a call um, with all the different Sankirtan leaders, I was just thinking how what they have worked mm, and with their intelligence, we're just trying to tap into that and try to port that to our local temple and try to expand. I was just grateful how uh, Srila Prabhupada has given so many great saints all over the world who are actually putting their minds so much to invent new things so that we can increase this Krishna consciousness more and more. So I was deeply appreciating that. Yeah, sometimes we notice that uh, we're endeavoring and we find some way to do service in, in an enhanced way. And then other devotees think of the same thing. We think, how do they think of that too? <laughs> There's a, sometimes a little feeling of competition. It's like, how do they figure that out? It's because they're getting the same universal intelligence from Krishna and they're praying and trying to advance themselves. Thank you. Where's Avantika, by the way? Okay. She's got work to do here, you know. Okay. I have a question um, about um, what if your uh, seva is kirtan? You know, if your seva is kirtan, then you're very lucky. <laughs> <laughs> That's a very lucky, lucky uh, thing. My experience has been like uh, the temples uh, don't always see that, you know, you're not chopping vegetables or stuffing samosas or whatever. Well, you know, it's more the attitude that we do everything in. Devotees, uh, you know, as far as a service attitude goes, devotees should be ready to do anything. I mean, sometimes uh, we can take the niche idea too far, and we can say, oh, I only do this, I don't do that. Like, I, you know, I've, I've seen before somebody like, um, they know all the Shastras and everything. There was a famous devotee who was knew everything, knew all the Shastras. People used to like forget verses. They said, what's that verse? And he would, what's that verse? And then afterwards, you know, Prashadam. And it's like, can you help sweep the floor? No. <laughs> so, you know, as a service attitude, niche market doesn't mean that, uh, like, I can only do this, I can't do anything. Devotees are willing to do anything. When Prabhupada came to America, you know, he, uh, he did whatever he had to do. He did what he had to do to please Krishna. So he cooked, and then he cleaned after all the devotees because they didn't know any difference. He, then he waited in line. You know, devotees, you just the restroom, there's just that small one little still there in the 26 Second Avenue. It's like they'd make him wait in line. They didn't even notice him. And he, he just took it in stride and um, did what he, you know, did the needful. That's one of the things the properties to talk about is doing the needful. So, by niche market, I don't, or niche service, I don't mean it's like, I, I can only do this and nothing else. But some people are, you know, they, pref they put a lot of energy into one thing. But w we should also be well-rounded as well. You know, we should, as I said, we should know something about everything and everything about something. And our mood should be like that too. Whatever service is there, if someone asks me, then it's uh, Krishna asking me. Someone comes, hey, can you help sweep the floor, chop vegetables? And it's like, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll do it. You know, unless you're on your way somewhere and he's like, sorry, somebody else already asked me, I have to do this. So there's like being flexible, that's part of being daring and active too in service. As somebody asks you to do something. I learned a great lesson that way too, because in the beginning in uh, deity worship, I was, I was a Sankirtan devotee, but they, in Chicago, they needed Brajaris, so they asked me to do some deity worship there. And they, I learned a little bit of how to do an artique and a few things. And then uh, soon afterwards, we were in Vrindavan, and the new temple opened up. And then everyone's smiling because you already know the story. 
but I, I got in a situation where I had to do the first artique for, well, not had to, I got to do the first artique that the devotees were doing for um, Sri Sri Radha Shamasundar in Vrindavan. But the thing was, Prabhupada was there and he was watching. <laughs> and I knew very little about how to do the, uh, the artique and so forth. But um, our team of devotees were so daring and active, they say, yeah, just get in there, <laughs> do whatever you can. <laughs> And I learned a lot from that situation, from sort of flubbing it a little bit. And, um, you know, I'm glad I did that. And after that, I had a determination to learn a lot more about deity worship and things like that. So you, have to, you also have to be daring and active in that way and sort of flexible. And, it, and it's nice to be well-rounded, too, learn how to do something of everything. Prabhupada was expert in so many things. That's when he went around the world. He, um, he taught everyone how to do this and that and everything else. I mean, Prabhupada's main servant, service wasn't being a pujari, but he knew enough about it to uh, obviously get the whole thing set up. And then he asked some of his disciples to write uh, Archanapadati based on the uh, Hari Bhakti Vilas and things like that and, you know, tighten things up. And, and uh, so a Brahmin should be well-rounded, learn how to do everything. You should know how to make Kitri and and do kirtan, you know, all these kinds of things. And, uh, yeah, some places will appreciate it more than others. Sometimes, you know, I like to do book distribution. Some places are more open to that and other places aren't. But um, there's always, always some variety of service that one can do. Now, a lot of devotees have been asking me about these books. So many have asked me, because they heard that the Lago Bhagavatamrita came out, and then ever since we showed them, I've been getting calls and emails, and when I walk in the temple, what's that blue book? Uh, what's it about? How do I get it? And so forth. I wanted to just read you an excerpt from an essay that one of the uh, scholarly devotees in Denver, Colorado, named Shamya Prashdas, just wrote. He read the book thoroughly, and he wrote a little essay uh, called The Importance of Sri Lagu Bhagavatamrita to Iskand Devotees. It's uh, about a thou 1,500 words, so in the time we have left, I'm just going to read a few uh, little points to give you a taste. This essay will be coming out as a press release in a few days, but just to bring attention to this important book. After much anticipation, the Bhaktivedanta Book Trust has recently released His Grace Gopi Puranadana Das's Posthumous translation and commentary of Srila Rupa Goswami, Sri Laku Bhagavatamrita. Rupa Goswami, whose Upadesha Amrita and Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu are foundational texts in ISKCON, received the complete mercy of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and is celebrated in his Pranam Mantra as the unique personality who has established within this material world the mission to fulfill the desire of Lord Chaitanya. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's mission was summarized by Srila Bhaktivinoda Thakur in Ten Principles, Das Mula. Das Mula. The, the first principle concerns itself with praman, the nature of evidence. How can the truth be known? The next seven principles deal with sambandha, knowledge of the relationships between all the aspects of the absolute truth. Therefore, the Lagu Bhagavatamrita, which briefly summarizes Sri Chaitanya's conclusions, on Praman and focuses on the essential points of Sambandha occupies an important place in the canon of Gaudiya Vaishnava literature. Written as an offering to his elder brother and guru, Srila Sanatana Goswami, Laghu Bhagavatamrita serves as Rupa Goswami's summary of Sanatana's Brihat Bhagavatamrita itself, a summary of the essential conclusions of the Srimad Bhagavatam. Noted for his rare combination of Sanskrit expertise and complete loyalty to Srila Prabhupada, Gopi Parananda Prabhu commented in his preface to the Briya Bhagavatamrita, Srila Sanatan takes it for granted that Go Krishna Gopal is supreme, that Krishna is the creator and controller of everything, and leaves the task of proving it to his brother Rupa Goswami, who later takes it up in his Lagu, smaller, Bhagavatamrita. Lagu Bhagavatamrita is therefore the condensed essence of the essence of Srimad Bhagavatam presented in two parts, the nectar of Krishna and the nectar of his devotees. In Lagu Bhagavatamrita, Rupa Goswami concisely expresses the foundational points of Gaudiya philosophy, which 
All of his successor acharyas have accepted and repeated according to their realization. Chief among these is the assertion that Krishna is the original supreme form of Godhead, a claim which Rupa Goswami validates through both direct and indirect means. Secondly, he convincingly establishes Mahaprabhu's achinta beta bed philosophy via a concise yet exhaustive presentation of Vishnu Tattva. Thirdly, Rupa Goswami lays a foundation of Shastric evidence, uh, arming his followers with ready, reliable evidence for many of the Sampradaya's claims. So this is a very important book. It's not, uh, it's not very long, it's lagu, it's small. Not like the Brihat Bhagavatam Rita. You'll find it very readable. Uh, we have a few left. I, pers I took this up as a personal cause because I think that the continuation of the um, Goswami literature is getting out into the world as fast as possible in this age of Kali is not only a miracle, but it's also very, very important. So even if you don't have time to read this book right now, take it out there and put it in your house just in case there's a, a major disaster in the world. At least the books will be spread all over the place and we can restart the Krishna consciousness movement <laughs> using all of them. You know, for no other reason you say, I don't have time to read it. It's all right. Just take it home, put it in your shelf. You'll be one of the uh, places where you know, people can find how to become Krishna conscious in its entirety, and this is an important part of it. Uh, thank you very much. Hare Krishna.